It is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well and having a good week so far, and I hope to see you on Sunday, if at all possible, either at 9 o'clock or at 10.30 a.m. If you can join us at one of those two services, I would encourage you to sign up online. If you don't have internet access, if you need any help with the sign-up process, as always, please feel free to get in touch either with me or with Kenna, and really anybody from the congregation who has an email account registered with the church website should be able to sign you up. They just put your name in instead of theirs but use their email to get into the system. So I hope you can do that. It has been working very well. We're thankful to Kenneth for helping and getting all that set up. We really appreciate that. And so uh, try to sign up if you can. It helps us to know who's able to come. And if we have visitors, we're able to tell them uh, which service might be better for them. In terms of good news this week, I am very thankful that my sister is in town this week. We've enjoyed being able to be together. At least I've been able to be with her and I've enjoyed it so I hope the feeling is mutual there but it's been good to have her here good to see her for a little bit and it was really good to see all of you on Sunday at worship the fellowship between the services this past Sunday uh, it was outstanding it I really needed that I don't know about all of you but it has been so long and it seems like we're making up for lost time and so a lot of people from the 9 a.m. service were able to stay a little bit longer and there were some coming to the 10.30 a.m. service who were able to get there a little bit earlier, and so there was some mixing between the services, and that was just an awesome thing, and hopefully that continues. And so those from the first and second services were able to see each other, and uh, that was just a great thing. Hopefully we can do more of that with the weather being as nice as it is. Uh, as we get started tonight, I just want to remind all of you uh, who are joining us on YouTube that YouTube does provide captions. And I know we kind of automatically do some of that on Sunday, but uh, for those of you joining us on YouTube tonight, if you're not on the phone, of course, you can't see the uh, subtitles there. But if you're joining us on YouTube, if you're interested, uh, you may want to enjoy the, the subtitles there, the captions. And uh, it might be different if you're using the app as opposed to the website. So I don't know exactly what it's like for you. It could be different on your device. But on my laptop, at least, through the website, there's a little uh, gear, like a wheel, in the lower right-hand corner. I've put a yellow circle around it on the screen there, for those of you who can see that. And when you click on that little wheel or the gear, it should give you some options, including captions. And I've put a giant yellow arrow on the screen there. This is a screenshot from last week, I think. And, uh, and so that's how you get to that. I almost hesitate to mention this, but you might also be able to change the speed of class tonight so uh, I'm not sure I'm not positive if that'll work during the premiere I'm just not sure how uh, YouTube handles that but it might I know it works after the premiere and it might work during it but you can speed up class so it's really fast or you can slow me down if I'm talking too quickly but anyway I hope this advice hasn't been too distracting uh, but I do know some of you uh, appreciate the captions, but I wanted to make sure to mention this just in case this is helpful for you. You may need to turn that feature on. Uh, tonight we get back to our study of the book of Acts. This is a history of the early church written by Luke, to um, Luke, who is the beloved physician, and he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus. And Acts, of course, is a history of the early church spanning roughly 30 years from 30 to 60 AD. And up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first five chapters. In the ABCs of Acts, we summarize chapter one with the word ascension, referring to the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. In Acts chapter two, we looked at the beginning of the church. So Peter preaches and 3,000 people are baptized and are added by God to the church on that day. In Acts 3, we saw a man carried by his friends and left at the temple gates. He's healed by Peter and John. And so the summary is carried and cured. So carried and cured for chapter 3. In Acts 4, Peter and John are arrested. They are threatened by the council to stop preaching about Jesus. But as we know, they are determined disciples. And so they continue on with the preaching as they had been doing previously. Then in Acts chapter 5, we had the empty jail as Peter and the other apostles are arrested and then they're let out of jail by the angel and then they, of course, go right back to preaching. So there was an empty jail in chapter 5. Uh, tonight, we plan on looking at all 15 verses of Acts chapter 6. It's a much shorter chapter than most of them and we have several options here as to the ABCs of Acts. I am most familiar with first deacons with a question mark. However, after studying this book personally with one of our members a number of years ago, she suggested forsaken widows. 
forsaken widows. And I believe she might have also suggested faithful Stephen, face of an angel, and free food. So she was on fire that night and had some very good ideas. We appreciate that. And all of these make for a tough decision. Faithful Stephen, face of an angel, free food, forsaken widows, uh, first deacons with the question mark. I do like the forsaken widows. So that really summarizes what's going on here, the problem that they were having. But it is ever so slightly negative, isn't it? Because it focuses on the problem, not the solution to the problem in this chapter. So... It's not perfect. We, I guess we really don't have a perfect summary of each chapter, but let's be thinking about this as we go forward through this chapter. For now, uh, I will continue to go with first deacons with the question mark there, unless somebody makes a convincing argument for something else. But I know you are a creative bunch, and if you have any improvements, anything that would uh, uh, beat out first deacons with the question mark there, I would uh, love to hear from you. So the first paragraph tonight is Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found, full, found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. In Acts chapter 6, then, we come really to the first real conflict in the early church. And I hope we notice it would have been very easy for Luke to skip this. If you're writing a history of the church and sending it to somebody like Theophilus, who was either a new convert or maybe a prospect, somebody he was trying to teach, it'd be really easy just to skip this whole incident because it's not the most glamorous. There is a problem. There is an issue between the early Christians. And so it'd be very easy to just avoid that difficulty and only include those things that were positive. But instead, he includes this passage, I believe, to show Theophilus how the early church handles conflict. And that's an important thing to notice about any group of people, how they deal with issues when they come up. Notice it starts with the church growing. In verse 1, the disciples are increasing in number. When a church grows, we often have growing pains. Growth often brings conflict. When we bring people into a group who weren't in the group previously, we obviously have the potential for issues, and that's what happens here. A complaint arises on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. And so this appears to be something of a, a racial issue. Maybe it's more of a cultural issue. There seems to be a language divide in the congregation here. Um, we have Greek speaking, the Hellenistic. That probably refers to their language, their Greek background. So the Hellenistic Greek speaking Jews, they've been added to this group that was made up almost exclusively of native Hebrews, those who were born and raised there in the Jerusalem area. And so there's a language barrier. There's also a, a culture barrier. We have two very different groups being brought together. But what both groups have in common, though, is that they are women. And the other thing they have in common is that all of them have lost their husbands. They are described here as widows. What the two groups do not have in common, though, is how they're being taken care of. There is a discrepancy there. There's a difference between these two groups. And this gives us some insight into what's going on in the church in Jerusalem on a daily basis. From Acts 2.42, we already know that they are continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. From Acts 2.46, we know that they are day by day continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. But we learn here in Acts chapter 6 that they are also apparently feeding the widows. 
there is some kind of daily distribution of food going on here. So first of all, I guess as a positive here, let's think for a second about hu how huge this is. The church is a large group of people here. We're talking 5, 10, 20,000 plus at this point. And we find from this passage that the church is apparently getting together in some way to distribute food on a daily basis. So this is great. I mean, they're taking care of their own. And we can hardly imagine this as a congregation really coming together on a daily basis to feed each other. That's a huge program. So some good is going on here. They are taking care of their own. However, whenever there's growth, we also have the potential for conflict. And that's also what we see here. As the church grows, a complaint arose, arises on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows are being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And based on this response, it seems that this must be a legitimate complaint. In other words, the apostles don't say, stop whining about this nonsense, get this out of here. Uh, this is just a made-up concern, nothing like that. But this is a legitimate complaint. Once they look into it, they realize, ooh, this is really happening. Along with the complaint, maybe there is some evidence provided. Maybe there's some eyewitness testimony. Yes, I've, I've been going hungry and these people over here aren't. Or maybe as soon as it's brought to their attention, the apostles realize, oh, wow, we really have overlooked something here. There really is an issue. So whatever the case, the, the 12 apostles, they bring the church together. So they don't solve this in the dark in a corner or something like that. But they bring it out publicly. They bring the church together. They state the problem. A lot of times it's hard just to state the problem, isn't it? You hear a complaint and it's really not the issue that's the issue. But they narrow it down here to the real problem. And then notice they provide some leadership toward a solution. I would also point out that the complaint makes its way to the apostles, doesn't it? If we have an issue with something, we need to bring it to somebody who has the power to do something about it. Otherwise, that just qualifies as whining. I hope that makes sense. If I have a problem, and if I go to somebody who doesn't have the power to fix it, to talk about it, to this person who doesn't have the power to fix it, chances are I'm just whining about it. Maybe I'm gossiping. Maybe I'm slandering if it's actually spreading a non-truth. But I would just point out here at the beginning as we study this, that this complaint makes its way to the apostles. I would also point out that these widows don't just quit, do they? And uh, a lot of times today, somebody has a problem with the church and their attitude is, I'm out of here. And they just go and they leave. They give up on the Christian faith. And I would also point out uh, these women don't just go to another congregation down the road. I know that can be a concern in some places where the church is uh, a lot larger than it is around here. So they don't quit. They don't move to another church. They don't try to overthrow the leadership. They're not, you know, carrying the, the, the pitchforks against the apostles here. But the complaint somehow gets to the apostles, those who had the ability to fix it. And so that's a good thing that we can say about this situation. And notice the apostles, once they get the complaint, um, they do not say, you know, you're right, we really need to try to do harder. In other words, they don't put this on themselves. They don't beat themselves up over this. They don't readjust their schedules to deal with the situation. But instead, they explain that, yes, this is a problem. But at the same time, it would also not be good for us to take care of this problem, thereby neglecting the word of God in order to serve tables. And with this, we need to make sure we realize that the apostles are not saying that serving tables is beneath them in any way. All right. So they aren't just saying that's not our job. That's not what's going on here as a way of not serving. But they realize that as apostles, they are uniquely qualified to teach and preach in a way that really nobody else is qualified. Remember, as we learned back in Acts chapter one, to be an apostle uh, the person had to be with Jesus from the beginning, and also they had to be an eyewitness of his resurrection. And so once those 12 men were established, their job is to teach and to preach. That's their number one responsibility. And so instead of them splitting their time between preaching and making sure widows are fed, they have a suggestion here, don't they? They put this back on the congregation. It would have been very easy for the apostles to develop a detailed plan and just hand out assignments. You, you, and you, 
do this and do it in this way. But that's not what they do here. Instead, they tell the church to choose some men to take care of this. And as they explain, they give qualifications. And so there is some kind of structure. There is some guidance here to solving this problem. But the church itself takes responsibility for doing the choosing. As I was preparing for tonight's class, I read an article on this passage by Tim Orbison, who preaches down in Gurley, Alabama, I think not too far right outside of Huntsville. And this is what he says. It needs to be noted that if the parties involved do not agree upon the proposed solution, then there will be no lasting solution. Anyone who tries to force an unpopular solution upon an individual or group will very likely be sowing the seeds of an additional problem without solving the first one. And I thought that was a very wise thing for him to say. It's an interesting, I think, accurate observation from a leadership point of view. And so the apostles put a good part of this back on the church with some guidance. The men they choose need to have a good reputation. They need to be well known by the congregation. They also need to be full of the Spirit, and they need to be full of wisdom. One thing I did find interesting is that cooking skill is not in the list of qualifications. They don't need to necessarily go out and find men who are successful in business. They aren't looking for men who are serve safe certified, as we would say today. They aren't necessarily looking for men who are skilled at organization and distribution of food and food production. You know, those are the things that we might go looking for if we had 10,000 widows who needed to be fed on a daily basis. This is a massive problem. But what we do realize when we look at the qualifications is that these men, above everything else, they need to be spiritual. They need to be known by the church. They need to be godly men. They need to be full of the Holy Spirit. So they're not just distributing food. This is the the issue that they have. This is the mission that they need to accomplish. But it is ultimately a spiritual mission that they're being given here. And so there are spiritual qualifications for the role that they're being called upon to fill. Anyway, the apostles set the qualifications. And notice at this point, they then toss it back to the church. They emphasize that they personally will devote themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So the apostles say, we need to pray. We need to preach. You guys, as a church, you select men using these qualifications to fix this problem. We're going to give them the authority to fix this. And then when you think about it, we realize what could have very easily happened here. If they had not come up with this plan, the apostles get distracted by the crisis and then what happens? They go out there and they personally feed these thousands of widows. And then as apostles, they fail to pray and to preach. I think most of us have probably heard about the tyranny of the urgent, haven't we? I think there's a book written by that title many years ago. But it's the idea that what is truly important can easily be pushed aside by one crisis after another. And so we know what we need to be doing but then this thing happens and we need to deal with it. And then we try to get back to our main mission. And then this thing over here happens and we get distracted by it. The tyranny of the urgent. Well, the apostles are avoiding this. And they're saying here, we will pray and preach. But you as a congregation need to choose some men to take care of this crisis. As something to think about, here's a little side question as we apply this. When's the last time somebody asked us to help with something and we said, I'd love to help, but I'm sorry I'm too busy praying. Have any of us ever had to say that? Maybe we need to say it more than we do, but uh, it strikes me in this description here that their mission is to pray and to preach, giving themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so they realize those are their top two priorities, and they can't let anything else, as urgent or as important as it seems, I'll let those two things fall out of the, the first place, even for something that is really, truly important, which this is. Uh, another note here, the apostles, um, they don't dismiss this crisis. When widows are going hungry, that's a crisis, and it's a legitimate crisis, and it's something that needs to be dealt with immediately. But instead of getting sidetracked themselves, notice they delegate this. That's basically what's going on here. Where else do we find a good example of delegation in Scripture? I think about Moses. Back in Exodus chapter 18, Moses is leading a group of two to three million people out in the wilderness. 
And if you remember from that chapter, they're, they're coming to him to resolve every little dispute. And they're standing in line from sunup to sundown, and he's dealing with stuff all day long. Well, Moses' father-in-law Jethro comes for a visit and sees this, and he basically tells Moses, this isn't good. It's not good for you. It's not good for the people. Obviously, it's not good for Moses and his marriage through Jethro's daughter. And he advises Moses to delegate. You, you need to put this on some other people. Let the people help you in this role, basically. I'm just paraphrasing that chapter. And that's what Moses does. He appoints leaders at various levels under him to take care of the smaller issues. And then Moses is able to pay more attention to the bigger picture, getting the people from Egypt to the promised land. It's not that those other disputes were insignificant or unimportant, but it's that everything was, was too much for Moses to handle effectively on his own. Uh, most of us have heard the old saying, it's better to put 10 men to work than to do the work of 10 men. And I, there's a lot of truth in that. And that seems to be what's going on here in Acts chapter 6. So in verse 5, uh, this plan is approved by the church. Yes, this sounds good. Uh, they choose seven men. They come back with the names Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas. Uh, beyond just the straight up list of names, we have Stephen described as a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then we have Nicholas described as a proselyte from Antioch, indicating he was probably a, a Gentile convert to Judaism. Um, what do we notice about these seven names? Anything unique about them? Do we see any Saul's in this list? Any, any Joseph's? Any David's? Any Daniel's? Any Abraham's? None of that. All of these names are Greek names. What do we learn from this? I've sometimes pointed out studying this chapter that the whiners were the ones chosen to take care of the problem. And I'm half joking with that. I don't mean to say that these men in particular were the whiners. Um, they are spiritually minded men. They are wise and all that. Um, however, with that said, it's interesting to me that the congregation chooses men with Greek names to fix the problem. Um, at the very least, these are men who understand the issue here. They are from a similar racial and cultural background. And also, they would be known and trusted by the women who were being overlooked. These are their people, if we would want to put it that way. Not that men with Jewish backgrounds couldn't have solved this problem, couldn't have worked hard, because we know that, you know, they could have done it. But there's a value to having Greeks fix this issue, because it is coming from the Greek-speaking widows. Um, and I would just briefly mention here that uh, at least two of these men, Stephen and Philip, they go on to become gospel preachers. Um, so their, their work is not limited to the serving of food, but they go on to preach. And um, Philip, in fact, uh, there are several references through the book of Acts where he seems to serve at least 20 years at one congregation in Caesarea. So either he was already qualified to preach beforehand or uh, serving in this role sparked something in him and gave him more of a motivation to serve. And maybe this was a growing experience to be put in charge of feeding thousands of widows and and seeing the confidence that the church placed on him and so on. And maybe that kind of encouraged him to go on to other things. I think I've uh, seen this in people in my own life. In verse 6, we have the appointment of these men. The apostles give the qualifications. The church chooses the men who meet the qualifications. They are then brought to the apostles, and the apostles recognize them and set them apart publicly by praying and laying their hands on them. And so they're chosen by the church, and appointed by the apostles. Uh, by the way, just a brief note on the laying on of hands. I know it's very easy for us to read that, and we assume often that the laying on of hands is tied to miracles. As I understand it, though, there are several examples of the laying on of hands in scriptures, and most of them are not miraculous. Um, yes, the apostles did transmit the, uh, the ability to do miracles by laying their hands on certain people, and yes, some people were healed by having hands laid on them. But we also have examples like this, and in Acts 13, 1, 2, and 3, where people are recognized and set apart publicly through the non-miraculous laying on of hands. And this part of it is something that we can still, to, uh, still do today. We might lay our hands or put our hands on somebody's shoulder in front of the congregation to indicate this person is being appointed and set apart to fill some special role. Uh, by the way, these seven men are still known as the seven. 
in Acts 21, verse 8. I think that might be a reference to Philip, one of the seven. And so it's kind of legendary here. The, the seven go down in history as the first chosen to fill this particular role. As we think about who these men are and how they were chosen and the work they were given to do, we obviously see some parallels between all of this and the work of deacons, don't we? Uh, deacons serve. These men serve. Deacons are chosen by the congregation and appointed to a position of responsibility. These men were chosen by the congregation, appointed to a position of responsibility and service. In fact, as I understand it, the word we translate into English as deacon, it goes back to a Greek word referring to kicking up dust by moving around. And the word came to describe those who served tables. Today in our culture, we would refer to servers or waitresses. And a waitresses has fallen out of favor, I believe, but uh, we, we talk about servers today. That's what this word means, uh, servants. And it would often refer to those who served tables. Uh, by the way, a form of the word is actually used in this passage near the end of verse 1 uh, with reference to the daily serving of food. Uh, that word is the word that we would normally translate into English as serve, minister, or deacon. It's all the same word. Um, unfortunately, it makes it a little bit confusing. We have three English words that kind of mean the same thing, but the Greek word behind it is the same, serve, minister, or deacon. And we kind of need to base it on context as to how we translate it and how we understand it. In this passage, though, these seven men are never referred to specifically as deacons. However, they seem to be doing the work that deacons might do. And there seems to be some wisdom in the selection process. We have qualifications given in Scripture for deacons, don't we? Um, the church finds men who meet the qualifications, and then perhaps the elders formalize and publicly approve that decision. And so there are, there are some parallels here. Uh, some have described these men as forerunners of deacons. I think my dad suggested that just a few weeks ago. Uh, when I was asking him for advice on, uh, on F in chapter 6 here, forerunners of deacons. Um, sounds a little bit strange, though. It doesn't quite roll off the tongue, forerunners of deacons, but it would be an accurate summary of Acts chapter 6. I guess I would go back to first deacons with the question mark, but I always have to put the question mark there. I don't want to say these were the first deacons because they're not specifically described in that way, but certainly they're doing the work that deacons uh, would, would tend to do today. So uh, they, they seem to be serving in that capacity, but forerunners of deacons might be a good description. Uh, I would make the same point about deacons that I made earlier about these seven men. Uh, they might do more of the physical work of the congregation, but their qualifications are spiritual. And that's true today. Deacons serve, but their service is critical to the growth and the health of the congregation. I know through the years I've heard people suggest that elders take care of spiritual things, deacons take care of physical things. But that is not really accurate. I, I understand the thought, I understand the feeling behind that, but I would emphasize here, biblically speaking, everything the church does is spiritual, including the feeding of widows. Let's continue on tonight with Acts 6, verses 7 through 15. And this is the last half of this chapter. Acts chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrias and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. 
basically verse 7 tells us that the plan for handling the hungry widow criticism works, doesn't it? So problem solved. Instead of derailing the growth of the church, they fix the problem. And the church continues to grow. And I would imagine this would be quite impressive to outsiders. These people take care of their own. They don't leave them hungry. Uh, their numbers are increasing greatly. We also know that a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith, which is just amazing. There were thousands of priests serving in, in Jerusalem. And they were insiders. They knew the law of Moses uh, more than anybody. And it's just interesting that, that something uh, triggered in their mind where they realized that Jesus really is the Messiah. And so those on the inside are, are being converted. Uh, we get back to Stephen. Basically, this sets us up for next week and what happens in chapter 7. This is background information for what comes next. Uh, here, Stephen, one of the seven men appointed to serve the widows. He is performing miracles, and the attention focuses on him. He takes the heat for a little bit here, and it, it seems like a certain sect of the Jews really gets worked up over Stephen. For whatever reason, they are the freedmen, including a group from Cilicia. And this is important because Saul, later known as Paul, is from Tarsus of Cilicia. Uh, some then assume that this is where Paul comes into the account, as he is perhaps part of this group. And we do see Saul or Paul mentioned at the end of Acts 7, the next chapter. Uh, but anyway, these men argue with Stephen. It seems to be very public, out there in the open, in the temple. Um, but they can't cope with his wisdom. They, they can't cope with the words or the wisdom from the Holy Spirit coming through him. And so they start inducing, maybe paying people to lie under oath and accusing Stephen of blasphemy against God and Moses. So now instead of arresting Jesus or Peter and John or the rest of the apostles, they've now moved on to Stephen. They drag him before the council. They make these accusations on the record. They accuse him of speaking against the temple, against the law, against the customs that were handed down from Moses. And when we think about it, there's a tiny bit of truth in each of these accusations. Yeah, Jesus did say the temple would be destroyed, didn't he? Yes, Jesus did, in at least some sense, speak against the law of Moses. At least it could be interpreted in that way. And yes, Jesus did have some negative words about their customs, like ignoring their aging parents and, and that kind of thing. So you could really see some truth in each of these accusations, but they've taken this and they've twisted it in a way to get Stephen brought up on charges of blasphemy. And the passage ends with Stephen really close to being given an opportunity to speak to the council. So he's, he's almost able to speak here. As he stands there before the council, Luke says they see his face like the face of an angel. What in the world does that mean? You know, is it glowing? Is Does he have confidence? Uh, you know, what is that? That's really all we're told. But it's interesting because Moses' face was shining when he came down from Mount Sinai. Remember that? Back in Exodus 34, verses 29 and 30. And so these people accuse Stephen of cutting on Moses. But in this account, Stephen actually looks like Moses, perhaps. It's almost as if God is, is putting his stamp of approval on Stephen here. This man, like Moses, he is my faithful servant. And this is a very good place for us to pause for tonight. Uh, next week, if the Lord wills, let's pick up with chapter 7. Between now and next Wednesday, let's do the best we can. I encourage this every week, but let's do the best we can to, to read Acts 7. And let's be thinking of some way to summarize Acts 7 using a word that starts with the letter G. I've got my ideas, and I'm going to share that next week. But if you think of some way to summarize chapter 7 using the letter G, uh, please let me know. I would uh, deeply appreciate that. And remember, if you haven't done it already, even if you have, try to read through or listen to the entire book of Acts all at once, if at all possible. It takes about two hours, 15 minutes, two and a half hours or so. And it'll it'll really help us get a, a picture of what's going on in the whole book. Uh, before we close, just another very uh, practical uh, note, I guess we might say, on delegation and congregational involvement, all working together on something uh, we have been extremely blessed as a congregation with a church facility. That, that has not always been the case. For a number of years, we rented. We rented an elementary school. We only had that room for three hours, nine to noon every Sunday. And we didn't have much responsibility. We had to put out chairs and take down chairs, and that was about it. Um, but since we purchased a building back in October 2001, we've been blessed with several people in that time who have taken on the mission of cleaning our facility on a regular basis, sometimes for years at a time. 
And uh, right now we're looking for some of you to take this on a month at a time so it doesn't become a, a burden on one person or one family from here to eternity. We don't want to make this a life sentence. It is a huge responsibility uh, to clean the church building every week for the rest of your life. That's a lot to ask. So, I mean, if you really want to, I guess. But, uh, but we'd like to divide that out on a monthly basis and see how that goes. Uh, this is a burden that we can share, and it is a great blessing. Um, my parents have taken the month of May, and um, they should not take the month of June. And if you're able to step up and take the month of June, that would be an awesome thing. And, uh, and then July and August and September, if we could get this nailed down to where we know who's going to be cleaning the building for the rest of the year, um, that would be great. We have a simple checklist inside the door of the broom closet at the top of the stairs at church. It's not a, a difficult thing. Um, as some of you know that the three elders sanitize surfaces uh, three times every Sunday. I clean everything. Everything that we touch, I clean before the first service. John comes in, he wipes everything down between the two services. And then Aaron comes in and he wipes everything down after the second service. Um, but we need all of us to step up a month at a time to do the rest, to, to vacuum and clean the bathrooms and take out the trash. Um, if you can help, let me know. I'll have a sign-up list in my Bible on Sunday. Um, between now and then, send me a message. Talk to me personally if you want to jump in for a month. As more of us are coming back together, I know we've gone a year without needing to do a lot of physical things like that. Um, but this is one way that we can help as we start to come back together. And really, even if you are not yet with us in person, this is one way you can serve behind the scenes. Uh, go over there <laughs> in the middle of the day or whatever when nobody's there. Don't have to interact with other human beings and serve behind the scenes in that way. Or feel free to team up with somebody else for a month, another single, another young couple, another elderly couple or whatever, and uh, team up and share a month. But uh, anyway, let me know. And uh, thank you so much for considering it. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you at worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 1030. This would be a great time to sign up. Let me know if I can help. Let me know if you have something we need to be praying about. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. Thank you for making us a part of your family so that we can learn how to love each other. As we face problems, we pray that we might handle these situations the way your people did here in Acts chapter 6, by listening to concerns, by bringing those concerns to the proper people, by responding to those concerns with love and with grace, and by continuing on with prayer and preaching and the teaching of your word. Tonight, we're thankful for the courage of your servant, Stephen. And we learn more about his, this man next week as we study his life. We pray that we might be willing to learn from his example in particular. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.